So uh, Gloucestershire remembers World War I, it's a partnership project. Um, yourselves, you're involved, and all of the other partners there. It's supported by the National Lottery and other uh, corporate funders. And basically, as it says there, it's a community and outreach programme. So um, just to give you a flavour of what the organisations who are involved with are doing in terms of community and outreach, uh, the Wilson in Cheltenham, they're putting together a six month exhibition of World War One material. They're also putting together new educational resource packs for schools and community groups based on their collections. And they're adding lots of digital images to a publicly accessible database um, for an online exhibition. So when the uh, six month exhibition finishes, there will be a legacy for that as part of the project. Uh, Soldiers of Gloss, they are helping schools find out a little bit more about Gloucestershire servicemen. They're also, they're also designing a, a database as well, um, which will be um, of all the soldiers who, in the Gloucestershire Regiment, who died as a result of World War I. And they're also providing guided tours of the Soldiers of Gloss Museum for adults and community groups. History Press, uh, we're working with them and um, the idea is that we're going to develop an online history pin channel which I'll talk to you a little bit about at the end and explain what that is and why it's so exciting. Um, and what they are also doing is they're using all the research that arises from the, the project to produce a legacy publication. Um, so again, there'll be a legacy beyond the life of the project that people will be able to learn from and benefit from. Uh, Everyman Theatre, who are the lead partners, uh, they have the most exciting, probably, uh, showpiece as part of the, the project. Um, they're producing a community play called Will Harvey's War, um, which is kicking off at the end of July. And basically what they're doing is their professional actors are working with community actors and community musicians to um, put together a play that's based on F.W. Harvey's unpublished novel um, about his experiences in the war, being a prisoner of war. Um, so that kicks off there, that'll be, that'll be really exciting and elements of the community research project will feed into little details um, in that play. They're also providing creative residencies of artists, actors, dancers um, and other creative people in schools um, using the research that arises from World War I material um, it's inspiration for creative work with schools, so it might be that a musician would go into school and work with a school group for a week and at the end, if they were a musician, they would put on a kind of display or a, a kind of performance of their, of their music inspired by um, World War I research. Um, they're also doing community tours and community plays um, with um, community actors and with disabled young people um, who are basically going to be involved with, with them and they're going to be trained with the actors and that these are going to kind of go on tour at community venues throughout the county. So hugely exciting, it's not just about a big performance in the Everyman Theatre, it's also about um, smaller performances with people who aren't professional actors all around the county itself. So that brings us on to us um, and our role in all of this. Um, the World War One project presents us with a unique opportunity um, to be able to showcase the power of archives, I think, and the relevance and the, the timeliness of them, and, and to show how they're central to commemorative activities and how they can kind of bring commemorative activities alive. Um, so we're working with, with yourselves and with school groups and communities to gather, preserve and share information about servicemen, about local communities, um, about those that are named on war memorials. And yeah, all those three elements together I'll, I'll talk about in turn um, in the remaining presentation, presentation the gathering, preserving and sharing. Um, we're also recruiting volunteers, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of our volunteers have done already in the, in the project. And um, we're also working with teachers and schools to create Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 resources. Um, that can be used to teach elements of World War I in the classroom. So it's a, it's a hugely full programme. It goes on beyond 2014 into 2050, but our involvement in the research project element is really for 2014. As, and as you can see, it's, it's really central to so many of the other creative outputs that 
um, the research is, is completed and it really kind of underpins a lot of the other work that's being done by, by other partners. So um, in terms of showcasing how archives are central to commemorative activity, um, we've got so many amazing collections, you, you know better than, than I do, the, the amazing collections that relate to the, the First World War here. Um, it's also an opportunity to make those collections widely available and to make them accessible to the public. Um, and it's not just about using printed documents, but it's about using other multimedia uh, documents that we have here. Um, and a lot of the work that I've been doing recently is with the BBC and the National Sound Archive to make sure that we can use some of the Century Speaks recordings um, that were made with people in the 1990s. And that meant that um, the memories of people who had lived through the First World War were captured. And it's now that we are valuing the importance of those, because obviously the Imperial War Museum has a massive collection of first-hand stories from soldiers who served at the front. But lots of local archives around the country have these amazing resources of people who experienced life as children growing up during the First World War. And I think it's important that we share these and use these to make people aware of archives, the power of archives, and to show that archives are, are accessible to all, really. Um, so I just wanted to play you a little um, piece uh, from one of those uh, recordings that we've just digitised. So a lady who um, was born in 1898, and she was born in Godrington, and um, she lived through the First World War as a child. And here in this interview with Anne Vivian from the BBC, she remembers what it was like to um, grow up in Godrington. And I'll just let the recording speak for itself, really. Can you remember the First World War yes, beginning? Yes, I can. I was uh, very upset because I thought my brother would have to go. My eldest brother wasn't physically fit to go. He, he had to, to live in the country with the fresh air. But my second brother was a very fine, very fine man. And uh, he, yeah, he did go and was out in France. But said the things that he saw were horrifying, terrible, terrible. The officer called for two good, strong chaps. And there was another, another boy from Gotherington. He lived up Manor Lane. He was a fine, fine strapping boy, and my brother, the two, those two were picked, and they, uh, their job was the Lewis gun, one that they could move a bit, yeah. and uh, it had been left behind close to the German lines, and they had to go and fetch it. Well, it fell to my brother to go and fetch it in the end. And he crawled so far. He walked as far as he could, and then he crawled in the mud all over it and uh, located the, the gun. And he said, fortunately, there was a, a piece of rope nearby. So he got that, and he tied it onto the gun and then on, round his waist, and he crawled through the mud with that Lewis gun until he felt he was in a safe distance away. And uh, he then stood up and, and pulled it through all the mud to the lines and got it back again. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Tell me about the end of the First World War. Well, as far as I know, it had been expected and uh, We'd been washing. Mum and I had been doing the washing as uh, we did every week. My mother's washing was just like driven snow. There was no no, uh, no chemicals put in it in those days. Uh, anyway, yeah, and it had been expected. And then the church bells rang. I think about 11 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And... Uh, I put everything down like that and I ran up the lane to the house at the top where a very old lady lived there 
uh, uh, Mrs. Butler, and uh, I told, and she was inclined to be deaf, and I I rang up and told her the news. Oh, she was so pleased, and that and uh, that night uh, there was a church service put on at seven o'clock at night, and uh, Mum and I walked over to Cleve and went to church. How did your father celebrate the end of the First World War? He didn't say much about it that I remember, except that he was thankful it was a... And the thing was to wait to hear from my brother that he was all right. I can't feel happy until that happens. But I, we couldn't get my brother to talk about the war very much. It was too dreadful for words, too dreadful for words. And he always remembered two very young boys being out there. Uh, they must have put their age up to get out there. And they were absolutely petrified. He, said, he often wondered what happened to them, but I should imagine that they were pretty good targets. And, uh, he never forgot it. It was two young boys so that they were remembered in one way with somebody, somebody. In terms of how we're enabling people to be able to do that, if you visit our website, as I'm sure many of you have done already, we're um, rolling out a range of resources <coughs> that will enable people to use our collections um, if they're new to them and will perhaps give you insights into our collections if you're already familiar with them to, to, to help your research. So we've got four research toolkits, um, a couple of them on researching servicemen in the First World War, uh, one on the home front in the First World War, and the final one about post-war life. And uh, they're free to download. You can uh, just log on and, and get them there, and hopefully they'll be, they'll be useful to you in planning your research, doing your research, preparing events, or however you're commemorating the, the centenary. Um, we've also got a lot of different information sheets that will enable research as well and enable us to uh, you to use the collections as well. Um, I won't run through them now, but um, if you log on, they're there and they're also free to download. And a lot of them have been created by um, volunteers um, who are part of the society. So we're hugely thankful for the work that lots of people are doing in terms of not only researching into World War One, but also creating resources that will enable others to look into World War One as well, which is a hugely important activity. We're also offering uh, training opportunities. Um, I'll be doing a couple of training sessions this month. Uh, the first on reminiscence work, sound recording, sound editing, and digitising photos and editing as well. Um, I'll showcase some digital stories in a bit and they're a really powerful way of presenting uh, your research, a really accessible way of presenting research and one that um, no matter how old you are, from age seven um, to a hundred, you know, that, that's something you can immediately dip into. Um, and then later on uh, in the month, I'll be doing a piece of uh, training about digital storytelling, sharing research, and again, history pin as well. I, I'm obviously leaving that as the kind of big tease since I've mentioned it already and not explained it, but we'll get on to it. Um, and the, these are some people that I've worked with on uh, previous projects and they've gained a huge amount out of the training and they're now using the skills to make sure that the heritage of um, their organisation building and plan as it happens is being recorded on an ongoing basis at the end of that project. So um, yeah, I mentioned gathering, preserving and sharing information and the opportunities that the, um, that the project presents us in terms of doing that. Um, <laughs> In terms of uh, preserving uh, information, I think it's really important to be able to identify archives that are in communities. Um, people might just have boxes of photographs, documents, all these sorts of things that are just in attics that um, if they aren't uh, praised and looked at and, and valued by, by people, I don't mean professionally, but you know, people think about um, these, the, these things and the importance of making a note of what they are and how useful they can be in terms of research, um, they're just going to be lost 
uh, the memory is going to be lost, people aren't going to value the photos, there's going to be no information about them. So it's important to, to take stock there. Um, we've put together a spreadsheet um, for people to kind of record information about resources that relate to um, family and local history and people that, items that people just have in their attics. And I think Steve's going to be sending that out to you all um, later on with a kind of help sheet of how to record it. So if you yourself have got documents in your, in your attics or you know friends that do, um, I think it's important to record those and in doing that, um, send them in and then we'll be able to um, take steps to preserve them digitally um, if that's the way to go or if people don't want to do that at least um, we can be aware of them so if researchers um, are researching into a piece of um, work on World War One, and it's that one piece of the jigsaw that they, they need to really bring their research alive you know that's the kind of thing that we'll be finding in community archives uh, photos, documents, those sorts of things and it would be great to be able to be aware of those at least because it will really enhance people's research. In terms of uh, sharing um, the, and the opportunities to share information, that's one aspect of, of sharing information. Um, it presents us all with an opportunity, not just um, ourselves as local history societies, but as I said, archives, to really raise awareness of ourselves and the, work, the amazing work that we're all doing to the wider public and to make sure that it gets out not just through um, exhibitions and publications, but to take advantage of media interests, to take advantage of wider events in your communities, um, and to share the great research work and information that, that you're doing there as well. Um, also to make sure that fitting commemorations of those who are named on war memorials are made, and um, digital storytelling is, is a great way of doing this, and I'll show you a piece of work that's been put together by um, one of our students from the University of Gloucestershire um, and she, she's um, worked on someone who is named on the Ash Church War Memorial and has put together a little story about his life so that um, it's not just the name on a war memorial that people can appreciate more about what this person's life was like and um, so that in a way it, it kind of brings him alive again for this brief moment in, in history which I think is, is quite powerful actually, um, when we see the story, um, and to make sure that heritage is shared widely in other creative engaging ways that, that I'll talk about. So I'm just going to play you a um, digital story about this gentleman that's named on the Ash Church War Memorial. His name's William Frederick Parsons, and um, the story really speaks for itself. The soldier we'll be looking at today is William Frederick Parsons. He's one of the soldiers listed on the war memorial at Ash Church. Using the census search on Ancestry, we can find some census records. From the document, we can see that his dad was a railway labourer. His mother, Emily, is presumably looking after William and his little sister, Violet. All of them are living in Pammington, near Tewkesbury. So now that we know where William Frederick Parsons grew up, we can find a little bit more about his early life using the records at Gloucestershire Archives. We can find out where he went to school. We know that the nearest primary would have been at in Ash Church. We're lucky enough to have the admissions register and the logbook for Ash Church Primary School. Starting with the information in the admissions register, we see that he was born on the 26th of July, 1896, and the date of admission is 17th of June, 1901. He was known as Fred rather than William. It's the first primary school that he went to, and he finished there on the 24th of June, 1910. The second record that we have relating to William's school life is an entry in Ash Church Primary School logbook dated 13th September 1904. The head writes, Fred Parsons, Standard 2, was climbing over the railings of the playground this dinner time when he got caught on the spikes and tore a nasty gash in the back of his thigh. I had him taken home. It's interesting that his 
name is written as Fred rather than William tells us a little bit more about him as a person and perhaps his character that he was caught climbing on the railings of the school. As we saw from the school admissions register, William left in June of 1910, so we can look at the 1911 census and see what William is doing after he's left school. From the record, we can see that his dad is now working as a coal agent. William's now 14. He's working as a coal agent assistant, presumably helping his dad. Violet is now 10 and attending school, and the family is still living in Pannington. When war broke out, William Frederick Parsons, like many Gloucestershire men, enlisted in the army. We can find out more about his military career on Ancestry by looking at the medal roll index cards. So we can see that William's corps was the Royal Gloucestershire Hussars. His rank was a private and his regimental number was 2838. He first served in Egypt in December 1915 and he was killed in action on the 23rd of April 1916 and was posthumously awarded the Victory British and Star Medals. Other records at Gloucester Archives can help us piece together the circumstances of William's death. William was killed at the Battle of Katia. We have a description of the battle written by one of the Royal Gloucestershire Hussars who was taken as a prisoner of war. He writes that on the 22nd of April they arrived at Katia late in the afternoon due to a shortage of transport camels and too much equipment. But camp became shipshape fairly soon and before dark the remaining men were sleeping in marching order. On the next day, on the 23rd of April, they awoke to a heavy fog over the desert which made it difficult to see anything between six and seven some turkish scouts were spotted this developed into a full-scale attack by the turks and the battle came to an end at quarter past three in the afternoon when the author of the description was taken as a prisoner of war by the turks using the newspapers at gloucestershire archives we can see how william's death was reported his death's recorded in the Roll of Honour, published in the Chartnam Chronicle and Gloucestershire Graphic from Saturday 13th of May 1916. He is also commemorated on the War Memorial at Ash Church, the village where he went to school. For more information about the Gloucestershire Remembers Project and to download free research toolkits and resources to help you learn more about the soldiers who fought from your community and how the war affected where you live, visit www.gloucestershire.gov.uk forward slash archives forward slash ww1 forward slash resources. I think it's, it's really worth emphasising that the only has never, I don't think she'd been to an archive before she started doing this research <coughs> and she's used one of the toolkits and learned the skills to put all of that together um, since November and I think that's, that's absolutely brilliant and it's a testimony to what she and other people from the university can bring to um, history research and to societies like yourselves and at the moment we're looking into um, interns for the 2014-2015 um, group from the university. So if you think that there would possibly be a role for someone in your society they could help share the research that you're um, doing, then um, drop me an email or talk to Heather um, at the end of the meeting. Um, have a think um, about what, what they might be able to do and um, we'll, we'll certainly look to recruit people if there is a need for them. Sorry Paul. Well, the next thing is that the PowerPoint's disappeared. The PowerPoint logo. <laughs> yeah, so digital storytelling uh, can be used in that way to help commemorate people that are named on the war, mor- the war memorials. Um, it's also a really powerful and accessible way of, of sharing heritage. I'll just play you um, one other one that I've uh, created with a guy who just had an envelope of photos in his attic. Are you? It's all right, Paul. I'm, I'm on it. You're on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, the documents that came in, these just a few of them, they were just sat there 
I think looking at them, you know, their faces that just stare out at you, you don't know what the story is there at all. And if they aren't interpreted and if they aren't shared, then they will just go in the bin because there won't be any reason for anyone to keep them because there's no information about them. They might not see the value in them. So in terms of taking this opportunity that the project presents us with to um, encourage people to think of the value of their, what they have in their attics and actually to record that information for future generations, it's really, really important. Um, some of the stories that kind of come out of these photos are incredible. Um, Paul, if you do me the honour of uh, firing up the, the next digital story, I think it's just amazing how it can go from a box of photos that don't really seem to interrelate to something where you can say, actually, I have a much better understanding not only of the documents, but of the people that this person's talking about. So um, yeah, I hope you, hope you enjoy it. And I hope you think it's something that you might also be able to do yourselves with the stories that you're, you're uncovering all the time. Edward Charles Davis was born in Compton Abdale, uh, near Northleach, 28th of April, 1892. And uh, he came down to the Forest of Dean, I, I would assume, uh, probably looking for work. And uh, we had relations down there, and so he stayed with them, and he actually enlisted uh, to the war in, uh, in Cinderford, 9th of December, 1915. That's fascinating, John. And uh, who did he then go on to serve with in the war? Although he wasn't that tall, he was five feet nine, but uh, he was in the Welsh Guards, and his number was 3929. And we've got a, a photograph um, showing the Welsh Guards taken in July 1917 here. Can you describe this photo for us and point out your dad in it? Well, my dad's in the, um, in the fourth row down and the fifth uh, man across. He's, he's on the right shoulder of Sergeant Brothers, who was the squad instructor. So we've got a letter card here, John, that is written from Southampton to um, your mother by your dad. When was this postcard sent, John? Why was, your, why was your dad writing it? Well, I think he is just about to embark for France. Whether it was the first time or not, I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, if I read it, it says, um, uh, it says, Sunday morning, my dear Ive, I'm sending you just a card so you will see I am still here. But we are going down to the docks again to see if we can get across. We went down yesterday and had to come back. We're having a fine time here as we go out in town at night. There are about 5,000 here waiting to go over. We may go today. We shouldn't mind stopping here a bit. Dear Ive, I hope this will find you well. I am A1 at present. Should like to hear from you, but I can't give you an address. I didn't dream of staying here like this, or you could have written to me here. Must close now with best love from Ted. And so what happened to your dad in the war? Well, I don't know too much about it. As I said, he never spoke about it, but <clears throat> all I do remember my mother telling me that uh, he had a shrapnel wound uh, near a um, place called Arras on the Western Front. And um, he was in hospital on, by the 25th of August, 1918, and he had an operation uh, two months later on the 21st of uh, October, eighteen. Um, why quite what the delay was, I don't know. But anyway, he was eventually discharged on the 31st of October, 1918. And there's a lovely description at the bottom of this document um, about your, your dad. Would you mind reading that for us yeah. there, please, John? It says, uh, description of the above-named soldier when he left the colours. Year of birth, 1892, marks or scars, nil. Height, 5 feet 9 inches. Complexion, fresh. Eyes, brown. Hair, light brown. 
it says he was discharged, no longer physically fit for war service. And it said after serving one year, 170 days with the colours, and one year, 157 days in the Army Reserve. And he was awarded two medals that we've um, we've got here as well for his for his service. Yeah, they are the uh, the normal um, um, uh, service medals. Oh, he was a very modest man. He never sort of um, shouted out about his exploits or anything like that. He just, you know, a typical sort of countryman born on the Cotswolds, and uh, that's how we that's how he was. Could you tell us what your mum's name was and when and where she was born for us, please? She was born Ivy Rose Mormon, and she was born in Drybrook uh, in 1897. And could you just tell us a little bit about her experiences in the First World War for us, please? Yeah. Well, um, her mother um, kept um, a tavern, not an um, alcoholic tavern. It was called the Coffee Tavern. And uh, she went to the local Drybrook school, and at the age of 14, she left school, and like a lot of other young ladies at the time, they went into service. Did she ever talk about the coffee tavern in Drybrook and what that was like? Um, not really, but um, I know I've got a photograph at home of, um, of the coffee tavern with um, my mother and her sisters um, standing outside. So it's it's possible that she learned the kind of skills of cooking and cleaning and keeping a place that she would then use when she went into service from her early experiences of growing up um, at the coffee tavern. I, I would imagine so. She never she never talked too much about it. I know money was pretty short. Um, I remember her telling me that her first appointment was at Alpen House near Yuli. And to get there, uh, she told me she travelled by train. And there she was met by a gentleman with a cart and taken to Alpen House. And when she arrived there, she said to the carter, have, um, have I got to pay you? Oh, no, no, he said, I work here as well. So that was her first appointment. I've no idea how long she stayed there because um, I know I think her next uh, the next place she went to was... Um, a uh, place called Rose Bank and the Stroud Road in Gloucester. She was uh, actually um, had a registration, national registration um, certificate uh, with that date on. So um, she obviously didn't stay there very long. So she she worked at Alpen House first, and then we've got her working at Rose Bank in Stroud Road in Gloucester. And then when we looked at um, some of the uh, postcards that your dad had sent, we've got one that's dated um, the 8th of April, 1918, and that's addressed to a, a different address there to Miss Mormon. Yeah, that's Miss Mormon, Ashford, Ashford Road, Cheltenham, Gloss. So she obviously uh, obviously moved on. Whether she was popular or unpopular, I don't know whether that, what that tells us. <laughs> And did she, what what did she say about her work um, as a as a domestic cook? Oh, she not not a lot. I mean, she did talk occasionally about life below stairs because she loved the program upstairs downstairs that was on many years ago, and uh, she used to talk of funny little stories about um, having a drop of sherry occasionally in the butler's pantry. But uh, not not, not a lot. I, oh, I do seem to remember in one place. I can't remember which one it was. She had very very bushy hair. And uh, the lady of the house said, you must get your hair cut. And my mother, apparently, she obviously didn't tell, you, tell it to the lady direct, but she thought, no way am I going to have my hair cut. So I think she bought a net or something and, and put over it to sort of co contain it a bit. But she was, she was quite a determined lady, my mother. That's lovely. Thank you, John. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your mum? She was a wonderful mother. She, um, you know, she uh, was a very human person. And uh, very lovable. Everybody, um, everybody loved her. And she was, um, she would like to describe it a family. So she wrote letters to everybody. So of course, of a, as a consequence, she had lots of letters back. And there are a couple of um, postcards, I think, that your mum sent to your dad. Could you just describe those for us, please? Yeah, they were em embroidered um, postcards that I think were very t um, typical of the day. 
Um, and this one says uh, on the front to wish you a happy birthday. And on the back it says to Ted with the happiest and luckiest of birthdays from Ivy. And there's yeah. another one here. Yeah, the other one I got, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not, I think it's uh, not an embroidered one. But anyway, it says forget me not. And it says kindest Christmas greeting from Ivy to Edward with best love. That's lovely. And the, the forget-me-nots on the front of the card would suggest that perhaps it was sent from Ivy to your dad whilst he was serving in the army, whilst he was away. It, it could well be. It, uh, it's not quite... It's, it is got from forget-me-nots on the front, but I think it's more or less an embossed one rather than uh, an embroidered one. But anyway, it's a very lovely one. Brilliant, John. So your mum and dad, they corresponded throughout the war. Uh, when did they start courting? Possibly, uh, I wonder whether the war might have brought them a little bit closer together. They obviously um, uh, both living in, in, in Drybrook, and um, obviously it was some years after the war ended that they uh, did eventually did eventually marry. This was my mum and dad's uh, wedding on October the 9th, 1923. I think somewhere at home I've got a little tiny report cut out of the local paper, and it refers to it as a very pretty wedding. That's lovely, and, and lovely that something so um, pretty as the wedding, as you say, could have come out yeah, of the, yeah, the, the, the war years. A tiny piece of paper, I, whether I, st- I know I've read it, whether I've still got it, I, know, I don't know, but it dates it, and I think it was at the, um, I think they got married at the Forest Church. What, what this digital story emphasises quite well is that you go from a, a position where you don't know the documents and you've got someone saying, no, my mum my dad, they didn't really talk about the war. Um, I don't really have much to say about these things. To a position where in just going through the act of interpreting and saying, just tell me about these documents, someone will say, oh, by the way, I've got a photo at home of my mum and her grandmother outside this coffee tavern in Drybrook. And, you know, this is a unique photo documenting, you know, wartime in Drybrook. And it's, it's amazing that someone can talk to you about this photo, who ran the place. And actually, if you look at the photo close up, you can look at the advertisement that's in the window of the coffee tavern and see what um, cantatas were on at the local church. So, yeah, there's huge value in actually beginning these processes of dialogue um, to say, you know, what, what have you got in your attic? Tell me about it, because the, the stories. They are of everyday people, but they're important stories because it tells you about life, basically, just life during a certain period in history that now should be really commemorated. So um, that's, my, that's my piece on digital storytelling. Um, I hope some of you will um, go away and think, yes, um, I'd quite like to come to the training um, and, yeah, I'd like to present my research in those ways. Um, I realise I'm running over uh, time here. And uh, I just want to quickly showcase the work with primary schools. Um, we're working with three primary schools, Slimbridge Primary, um, Berry Hill, who've just been to visit us, and uh, Long Levens. And the teachers are developing key stage two resources with them. Um, I know that the local history society in Slimbridge has been in contact with Slimbridge Primary, and um, Berry Hill are looking to get in touch with um, the local history society. So um, if you're from the forest, then you could possibly give a bit of advice on um, what the area was like uh, during the wartime, then um, do get in touch with me or leave your name with Heather and I'll, I'll be in touch and hopefully put you in touch with the um, primary school teacher there. Lots of exciting work that they're doing. Um, they're writing postcards from the front. Um, they're doing brilliant work going down to their war memorials to, um, to transcribe the names and then use ancestry and um, all of the resources that we're signposting people to through the toolkit to find out a little bit more about, uh, about what um, the soldiers' lives were like. Um, this is from the visit this morning. Um, Berry Hill Primary School came and saw a few documents um, that related to the Forest of Dean, that related to Berry Hill in World War I, had a nice tour. And when you show them the documents, and they see something that's a bit different. They see it, all of the documents are amazing. I'm not belittling our documents here at the archives, but kids just go for multimedia and they go straight to the digital story they want to listen to uh, the information straight from the horse's mouth. And um, they were listening to a digital story there 
um, of a lady who um, grew up um, in Berry Hill and her mother ran a shop there. And this is again from the Century Speaks uh, collection. And so that just shows you right there how if we're looking to share information and research about um, World War I to people who wouldn't ordinarily engage with archives and documents they can't read, this is a really good creative way of sharing that, those stories with them in a way that they can understand and engage with and really want to. History Pin, sorry I wasn't going to leave you hanging there. Um, History Pin is, is another digital means of sharing information, so whereas we looked at a digital story beforehand that showcased um, William Frederick Parsons' life there, the website basically provides an opportunity to pin um, photos that people may have in their collections at home, photos here at the archives, onto what's effectively like a Google map. And whereas with Google Maps you can kind of move through space, on History Pin, you can kind of move through time as well as space. So you can focus, say, on somewhere like Ashchurch and um, look at all of the photographs that have been pinned in a certain time period um, to do with, with Ashchurch. So you could replicate that anywhere around the county and it would be a way of commemorating, say, the people that were named on your local war memorial to pin photographs that you have relating to them, stories you can upload digital media to them. Um, so History Pin is quite an exciting source um, that we're looking to develop um, a channel on Gloucester Members World War One with the project. We do need people to help us manage it though. So if you're interested in getting involved with learning how to use it and you think it'd be something that your society could benefit from then uh, definitely get in touch with me. And um, yeah, I'll be running some training sessions on how to use that uh, later on. And uh, yeah, if you're looking for further opportunities, um, do visit the Gloucester Members site, do visit the Archives website as well. We've also got Facebook and Twitter channels if you're inclined towards social media. Um, the advantage of those is that if you're used to scanning photographs, you've got digital images, you can just upload them straight away to our Facebook channels and share the information that you've got about them with the world. Um, so yeah, these are just some of the, the opportunities the project presents. Um, I hope I haven't bored you too much, and thank you very much for, for listening, and I wish you luck with all of your World War I commemorations this year and beyond. Thank you. Would any contact made with the possible descendants, relations of that particular man? Um, so that, that could, could be an issue, couldn't it? Yes, yes, indeed, indeed it, it could. And uh, we haven't publicised that online yet. Um, but obviously, it, especially using things like the Century Speaks recordings, that's the next step to say, okay, we can, you, we can use the documents, but can we, you know, can we contact the families and see if they would be alright with us doing that? So that's the that's the next step before we bash all of this online. So yeah, you, you've had a kind of sneak preview of what we might do with digital media, but we haven't gone global with it just yet. Just a quick sort of technical question. Courtesy of National Archives, courtesy of Ancestry, mm -hmm. do you have to ask them every time? Or is there some blanket what, agreement or what? What I've done is I've been in touch with um, the National Archives and uh, with Ancestry. And um, uh, in terms of creating uh, multimedia that is under the umbrella of the Gloss Remembers project, um, they're very happy for digital images of military records and censuses to be used um, as long as it's all badged up under the Gloss Remembers project and with those um, acknowledgements there. So um, yeah, that's been a bit of a coup actually, really, because with the, with the toolkits we're signposting people to those avenues, to Ancestry in particular, and so for them to be able to say, yes, um, if you're creating multimedia using our images, then yeah, do so by all means. Only via you. Only via you at the moment. Um, yes, we haven't we haven't kind of rolled it out, but that the understanding that I, I came to with them was that if it's branded in terms of Gloucester members, then it's fine. Okay. Well, thank you very much.
Well, thank you again, Ollie. Um, as Ollie said, we'll, um, Vicky will be emailing out the, uh, the spreadsheet and the notes for people if you do come across um, unknown, unusual sources to fill them in and return to the archives. And I think also, Ollie, it would be very useful if we also accompany that with, with the notes to various websites and perhaps even mm -hmm. some, some summary pointers. You, you, a number of times you said specifically there are things that perhaps local societies could help with or would be particularly help them to look at. So perhaps we can we can just send a, a, a few notes of those out as well. Sure. So yeah, but that's I'll talk to you. But this will be coming to you pretty soon. So thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. So it's all going very, very well. And, uh,